Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, we have the next panel starting in a couple of minutes, uh, which will be on the maritime security issues in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but before we go ahead with going to the next panel, we have uh, Lieutenant General Mark Poffley, uh, Chief of, Deputy Chief of the Defense Staff, uh, focusing on military capability. Uh, we missed him in the morning panel, so we are going to give him an exclusive floor uh, to address us on the subject of the role of private industry in the defense sector, uh, like defense security corrected, I'm going to put it as the Indian requirement and the UK to share its experiences. Uh, to, so we look forward to your address, and then we will take a few Q&A before we move on to the next panel on maritime security issues. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's always good to see a few people here still after lunch, and I, it's the first, first event I've been to where I've been told to settle down at the dessert counter, I have to say. <laughs> That's quite an encouraging thought. Um, I, forgive me not being around uh, this morning. I was called away with the, our, our Secretary of State for a meeting uh, over the road. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I regret that because it was an opportunity to engage in the conversation you were having earlier on. And so I'm very grateful for the opportunity just to pick up a few of the things that I might have said earlier. I, I should perhaps just explain my role. I sit as a member of the central staff in the UK Ministry of Defence, so I work directly for our Chief of Defence Staff. As you can see, I'm an Army officer, but I uh, head an organisation that is populated by all three services and senior civil servants. And our job is to provide advice to the Secretary of State and the Chief of Defence Staff on the strategic balance of investment uh, of the UK defence budget. And then I have some specific responsibilities which I will listen with some interest to your next panel session because one of those is to act as the senior responsible officer for bringing in the British aircraft carriers and the F-35 fighters that will populate on them. So those services in the UK that wear blue um, uh, either covet my view or indeed look to make sure that I am attending to their particular agenda. Um, I am given broad responsibility for a range of other things that are of strategic interest to the United Kingdom, uh, including things like the nuclear deterrent, uh, the estate, uh, and as you heard from the Secretary of State this morning, uh, there's quite a lot of active work to reduce that and make it more efficient. Uh, and I also oversee uh, the retention of two principal components. The first is the retention of operational advantage and secondly, sovereign choice. And in those two roles, I am intimately involved with industry in discussing the requirement that they set, or we set as the military uh, for our capabilities going forward, uh, and making sure that they are uh, complicit in servicing that requirement uh, and maintaining uh, relationships both across the industrial sectors, but more particularly across international uh, communities where we believe that there are some mutually beneficial security and economic interests. Um, when we look at a requirement, therefore, in the United Kingdom, and I think this is the major change that we have seen in the course of the last five to ten years, we are taking due account of the fact that we may, from a military point of view, need to adjust that requirement to service wider needs, whether they are political, industrial, international, or any other. And that's quite an important dynamic because whilst I am uh, quite clearly bound to provide the Secretary of State and the Chief of Defence Staff with advice from a military capability point of view to ensure operational success, what I am not prepared to compromise on is the notion that we would enter a fight with anybody uh, on a fair basis. The aim, certainly from my point of view, is to never enter a fair fight, that we always have the advantage, uh, whether it's in qualitative terms or in quantitative terms. Now, if I were to describe my international responsibilities, it is to look at those roles and those countries where we think we have mutual interest. And if you look at certainly the United Kingdom and India, there are many, many areas 
in which uh, we share a view and share uh, an outlook on capabilities. Um, in the land area, uh, I think it is universally the case that our armies have um, a good understanding of each other and certainly their challenges are universal ones. I don't think they're unique to any part of geography. Uh, they, they are very much about how do you deliver um, heavy effect whilst at the same time retaining mass to be able to deliver uh, more constabulary operations on a routine basis. In the maritime and air sectors, again, it is the utilisation at an affordable price of very high-end capabilities and the retention of that technological advantage so that you can take that forward into the future. So there's some big areas there. And those, therefore, we're looking to sort of balance requirements in a number of ways. Firstly, how do you maintain that technological edge? And therefore, I provide oversight for the UK Defence Programme of our science and technology and our research and development agenda. And we focus that quite deliberately by setting uh, both industry and indeed our own uh, science and technology community. And we anticipate working closely with the DRO here in India um, to make sure that actually we do not waste our time both researching into things that are of mutual interest. We look to avoid some levels of duplication and to share that technology, and you heard some of that earlier on this morning. The second principal issue is that issue of quality versus quantity. And we, I think, in both our countries, are seen as reference nations for many other nations around the globe. Um, from the United Kingdom point of view, we uh, are quite clear we are not slaves to any other nation's agenda, but there are many nations who imagine themselves more closely being British, or at least the way the British are operating, uh, rather than American in our case. Uh, I would suggest to you, in India, you're similarly seen as a reference nation with many other nations feeding off your ambitions and your outlook. And we think there are some very obvious mutual benefits there, not just from the military point of view, but into the commercial sector too. So getting that balance between uh, quantity and quality, between utility and high end, is really quite important. Uh, the second, uh, sorry, the final thing I would say is that my job is all about making sure I get good value for money. And therefore, we're intimately involved in making sure that industry is connected with us as the military requirement setters, making sure that they understand what it is we're trying to achieve, and that is mutually beneficial because I need all of them to be in business, I need them to make a profit, and I need them to retain a profit because I need them to exist into the future so that I am not constrained by a single choice. I retain choice in where I can go and buy and how we can deliver uh, our uh, capability aspirations. That means I also need to be commercially savvy. And I think, as the Secretary of State pointed out in his address this morning, um, we are making sure that our military are better tuned to be able to handle large corporate programs. Uh, for the Army, uh, their budget sits at around about £8 billion, and our Chief of the General Staff spends an awful lot of time doing corporate business, running an enterprise that is an £8 billion a year enterprise. And he is becoming far more savvy in talking to industry and others about what the requirements are, not just in the contemporary space, but into the longer term too. So I think there are a number of key issues that, from my point of view, come out in the conversations that you've probably had while I've been absent. The first is that there's a need for us to coalesce understanding of our requirements, to make sure that actually your requirement and ours are matched, and to make sure that both uh, industry here in India and uh, more broadly in UK and I would suggest with many of our other partner nations are properly tuned to what we're trying to achieve so that they can configure their business around that and make sure that we're uh, consistent into the longer term. The second issue is the need for us to share technology. And quite clearly, both countries will have sovereign 
uh, interests that are not to be compromised. But actually, quite a lot of this stuff is um, relatively easy to transfer across. But it does require us to uh, understand each other's um, interactions with other nations so that we are quite open with each other about how we would um, exploit uh, the synergies. Uh, on exploiting synergies, um, I think it is also important for us to exploit the economic and commercial uh, issues to promote competition and spread influence. As a security professional, most of my experience, particularly in the context of counterinsurgency operations, but I think it holds more broadly to other types of operations too, uh, we are interested in uh, maintaining economic alignment because if you get economic alignment, you tend to find that political alignment follows, which then leads to social alignment, and by and large, security is a, is a devolved uh, symptom from a failure uh, uh, of a social issue, whether it is uh, the distribution of wealth or inequality in any other form. And then the final uh, thing I think you should be thinking about uh, in building this relationship is about the establishment of that reference status and how much leverage we can apply both in the military context but actually more realistically in the commercial context to ensure that we're absolutely able to maximise the benefit. And again, I would suggest to you that both the United Kingdom and India represent reference communities that others will wish to map onto. So that notion of a third party interest group and the ability to exploit into it, I think is alive and well. Uh, and I think uh, we should be sharing uh, capability interests such that we can exploit on that, that community of interest. That's as much as I was going to say, recognizing I don't want to steal the thunder of my maritime colleagues, uh, although I will look and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, attend to their words with some interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, General, and I think that was a very, uh, uh, very useful uh, addition to uh, what uh, the discussion that we had in the morning. Uh, I think a couple of points that uh, one is the last was the end you remarked uh, in your, of your remarks, you talked about as to maintaining certain alignments and you started with the economic alignments and then gradually moving to political and security. I would have thought uh, possibly the other way around, maybe the political alignment is possibly the biggest factor in kind of, uh, you know, uh, in meeting different requirements and so on and so forth. Uh, that could be taken up maybe uh, later in your remarks. Uh, the other aspect, uh, given your role, uh, the, you explained your role in your of, of your current office, and I think again a point that I raised in the morning, but I want to ask you again, is to how do you manage effective interface between the private sector, the government, and the armed forces requirements and kind of things, and essentially create a uh, sound ecosystem in a sense. And how does how does has that process been smooth, or did you have, uh, have did you have to do uh, how, how did the role of the government, in a sense, evolve in the last few years with the coming in of the uh, private sector in a big way? Um, well, I think, uh, let, let me tackle that last um, issue first. Uh, the reality of this is that, um, uh, you know, we, we enter into any discussion uh, recognizing that various groups have interests, and you've got to attend to those, and in a way, um, uh, we would be naive in the extreme if we did not. Um, from an economic point of view, um, we spend in the UK about £36 billion a year on defence. And if you think of it as an insurance policy, there is a tendency for that to be seen as a straightforward insurance policy, and people by and large don't like paying for insurance policies. So we're looking to try and get more, more out of that particular policy um, with some form of secondary and tertiary benefits from the investment. Um, uh, the Secretary of State um, mentioned the work we were doing to realize estates and the notion that companies like Dyson and others uh, are potentially occupying some of our estate. We think we can apply leverage to quite a lot of our assets. Um, uh, we think we can do better to uh, engage in a more commercial conversation about how we're used. And we certainly think we should be doing better um, uh, to, to maintain the interests of our population at home. Now, funny enough, you tend to find as you go through that process 
that there is political, economic, and military alignment uh, in many of the things that we're doing. So it is about managing a conversation. Uh, and as I was remarking to uh, one of the delegates earlier on over lunch, um, you know, I'm, I'm a great believer in liberal dictatorships. Um, you know, I believe in a dialogue, but then there's an issue of some orders downstream at some point. And I think from my point of view, my responsibilities are to deliver some direction for the three services, empower them to get on with it, and try to open up the dialogue that they might have with uh, their economic, political, and commercial uh, advisors. Uh, and uh, by and large, it works. Thank you. Uh, I think we have, I don't want to cut into the, uh, seriously, the next panel, but I think we will take a couple of different, a couple of questions and then move on to the next panel. Uh, ambassador. Uh, Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former ambassador, and uh, have some experience of dealing with technology transfer um, during the bad days of the 80s and the 90s with the US. We had an overarching agreement called the MOU on technology transfer with the United States, which was the beginning of those little driblets that we used to get at that time. I am, of course, now um, uh, quite uh, sort of uh, encouraged by the fact that we don't need that that MOU anymore since the levels of technology releases have gone up many fold. But do you think that uh, overarching agreement uh, on technology transfer general uh, will be good, it will send a good message uh, to the private industry as well that look we have the backing of the two governments uh, on this and that technology agreement uh, or the overarching MOU can build in uh, issues of concern like IPR and things like that. Thank you. Um, well, uh, firstly, uh, relatively straightforward answer. Yes, I do think that um, those would be of benefit. Indeed, we're having a conversation with uh, the capability staffs here in all three services and into the center of the uh, Indian Ministry of Defense to establish uh, the rules of the game for um, the sort of technological transfer. Indeed, when we look at the DSTL and uh, your research and uh, uh, development organizations here. Uh, uh, as we have done with other countries, uh, and we are only having these capability dialogues with those countries where we think we've got mutual interest, um, we have uh, established exactly uh, those sorts of agreements. If nothing else, to bound and to give confidence to those people, uh, both in the establishment and in commerce more widely. And again, um, the protection of IPR is absolutely uh, a fundamental for us. Um, one of the things that may have come up, I don't know whether it did in the previous panel session, was the creation of a, a, an organization we call a defense solution center, where companies are able to provide um, details of what they are working on, how far their uh, ideas have developed, and submit um, into a government-funded organization a list of um, where they see opportunities in, in respective markets going forward. The, the deal is that we protect absolutely their IPR in that discussion and that the government uh, acts as a facilitator to get companies to share where we're seeing mutual opportunities. We look to uh, a bit like a sort of fast dating house uh, put those companies together such that they can uh, exploit on that idea if they choose to. It preserves their IPR and it provides sensible ground rules for them going forward. The same applies in the science and technology area, and I think we would wish to be doing exactly that. So I think uh, uh, longer, uh, longer homily on the back of a short answer, which is yes. Uh, General, I'm Major General Chakravarti. I just wanted your suggestion. You would agree if you make defense products, no armed forces, even you, the amount of products you make, the British armed forces are not able to buy it. So you're giving us technology. Do you see a case for technology being given and an export market being created with India and UK cooperating? Well, that's the only way that will be a win-win factor economically as you are brought out. What are your views on this? Uh, well, clearly, um, our ambitions are, and it, again, it comes to the heart of um, potential for us to share experiences in terms of taking large 
uh, corporate commercial enterprises and, and, and making sure that um, we're not their sole source of income. Um, we are definitely in the business of um, looking to tailor requirements to meet um, a commercial opportunity that is beyond the UK military requirement. Uh, ironically, given the next conversation we're about to have, one of the forefront of that is the creation of a general purpose frigate, which we have in the course of uh, my team have been looking at a national shipbuilding strategy for the United Kingdom. And in that, we are refining for the Royal Navy a general purpose frigate, which is not bespoke, that has the capacity for a modular uh, configuration for uh, whether it's uh, anti-submarine or surface uh, warfare, uh, that, is, um, uh, that is absolutely configured for an export market and not for the UK alone. The UK will operate it. And it will then look to exploit the reference status from the high-end capabilities that we've got in the form of our air defense destroyers, the Type 45, and our anti-submarine uh, uh, frigates coming in, uh, the Type 26. So the Type 31, which is what we will call it, uh, will provide an opportunity there for many other navies, we think. We will look to configure the systems on it. So for example, the missile launcher will be configurable with weapon stockpiles, not just from the UK, but actually ideally from a broader portfolio of navies. That's the sort of way that we think we absolutely should be exploiting out, and that's why I make the point about reference status for both India and the UK, because there's mutual advantage here if we get this right, where the UK has a community of interest that will want to map other nations will want to map onto it, and there are nations that will want to map onto India, and they're not necessarily coincidental. So you, by working together, actually get to that broader community in a much bigger way than you would have done otherwise. But absolutely, it is about making sure that these companies, particularly the larger ones, are not solely dependent on the UK defence budget, but actually are looking for a broader, broader market. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I think, uh, I think we are done. I think a lot of ground has been already covered since morning, but I think there were a couple of specific questions for you. Uh, at this stage, thank you very much, General, and a hand of applause for General.